Good morning. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to greet you all and thank you very much for this opportunity to share my ideas on this theme. Uh, I hope it doesn't take too long as my ideas uh, in English needed some time to be explained. Okay, let's, let's start. Architecture and uh, still life. One, the beginning and the end of architecture. In the 15th century, Alberti used to say that the city was like a big house and that later was like a small city. I begin my essay with this Albertian correspondence because for this author, born in 1044, what connected architecture to the city was precisely his craft as an architect. In other words, at that time, there was as yet not disciplinary specialization to hinder this beautiful metaphor of the house as a city or of the city as a house. The former with corridors that were like streets, later with squares that were like rooms of a house. Later, when Aldo Rossi referred to the architecture of the city and subsequently and ad admittedly through him, Nuno Portas recognized this genealogy in 2007 by republishing his book, The City as Architecture. It was this possibility that they both set out to talk about. And this is the reason why my approach to this theme of this colloquium is based on the catastrophe of architecture itself. If the word city still makes sense, as I believe it does, and then I wish to note under the scope of this seminar, the architecture cannot and must not be ruled out of the equation. Architecture seen, of course, as an everyday thing, as Fernando Tavra used to say, and not as a matter of fame and stardom or something placed at the service of some system, financial, representational, symbolizing an autocratic power, etc. In other words, perhaps it is possible to establish a causal connection between two catastrophes, that of architecture and that of the city. Two, architecture, that language, one. In my view, the person who in our time has best attempted to reflect upon the catastrophe of architecture is precisely Giorgio Grassi. In a famous drawing for an etching in 75, Aldo Rossi pictographically represents the mutilation of the corpus or the corpses of architecture. But Grassi later problematized this same question in two texts in the form of a diptych, Architecture Dead Language 1 and 2, from 84 and 88 respectively, which provide us with some essential clues for its understanding. Perhaps because of the silence that they both maintained in relation to one another after a certain point in their parallel lives, the Rossi-Grassi relationship has been systematically silenced. As this is not the most opportune moment for delving deeper into this question, it is important simply to bear in mind that Aldo Rossi, who was four years older, shared the studio, teaching duties and some small projects with Giorgio Grassi. Of all these projects, San Rocco was the most significant. So, so much so that it gave its name to an interesting architectural journal that through this subtle and not very openly stated reference, 
seeks to imbibe the spirit that must have been shared at the studio at that time. At least this is how I interpret the, that interesting editorial project to which Grassi granted a harsh and somewhat caustic interview published in the Portuguese version of Escritos Escolhidos. To make a gross simplification, I should say that faced with the prodigious success of Rossi's The Architecture of the City and a scientific autobiography, architecture and the, as a craft, the logical construction of architecture, and the more recently published in Portuguese, A Life of an Architect, could, could only aspire to attract the interest of a small group of readers, architects, for whom the undeniable artistic quality of Rossi's oeuvre, of which his drawings are an integral and self-sufficient part and not mere mere representations of artistic architectures, does not replace, in my point of view, Grassi's problematization. Architecture dead language is, in my opinion, a beautiful apocalyptic title that Grassi claims to have stolen, his word, from Arturo Martini, perhaps, as he says, the contemporary sculpture that he most admires an artist who wrote in a free and authentic way, just as he expressed himself in his art. An artist who knew very well what he was doing and why. The first architecture dead language appeared in the context of a symposium. In Berlin, about individualism and convention a pair that Grassi inscribes in a deeper division, which is of greater interest both to himself and us, between, between individual talent and collective work. The question that this essay problematizes, and which is particularly evident in the first version, is the collective nature of architecture and art, or, if you prefer, of a certain art that Gracie radically identifies as ancient art in general and has the work of some artists from his time in particular. Grassi does not explicitly state this here, but the question of collective dimension of work acquires for him a central status in architecture, even more so than in art. Or, if you prefer, he plays an inalienable role in architecture as a craft, another beautiful expression of his that we cannot discard and which is intended to identify a work space that is different from that of architecture as a profession, different from what Grassi pejoratively refers to as professionalism. In this sense, Carlos Machado, is right when he boldly states that Giorgio Grassi's architecture is not designed to please. Like real art, it might be headed. The fact that a certain empathy might later be established is the consequence of an effect that is not sought after in his architecture. A profound commitment that is not displayed on the surface but which instead demands a closer look at the conditions under which the work is designed and constructed. The architecture that Grassi speaks of is therefore, on the contrary, architecture as a craft. In other words, it is an artisanal activity, among many others, which in this sense is linked to the so-called popular art of anonymous craftsmen whose secrets are designed to last for a long time. It is an activity, therefore, that results from practical learning, from oral transmission, from the economy of means as a discursive resource, 
as inert povera, for example, from repetition as a form of execution, from the desire for perfection of shared technical and formal solutions. In short, it is an activity that results from the recognition of the individual and the idiosyncratic, without prejudice to the collective and the customary, the unique as the opposed to the diverse, and this as opposed to that which is identity-based. It can, however, never be stressed enough that Grassi does not exclude architecture from the domain of art. His position might be described as being similar to that of Adolf Luz. In architecture, only a small part is art, the tomb and the monument, that is the funerary monument and the celebratory monument, the silence of death and the elevation of life. It is in this context that Grassi points to the possible death of architecture. Architecture, he says, has today become almost exclusively a question of taste. Reduced to its spectacle, it has become a very small and complicated question, as irritating as it is evidently useless. It is, in the canonical acceptance, the same architecture as it is always has been. It seems to no longer have space as if it had nothing more to say about itself, being transformed into an hindrance with its great overload of answers that all refer to one another. Or, better still, it has been converted into an obstacle, just as happens with an expressive medium that has lost its finality, its reason for being, just as occurs precisely with a dead language like Latin. Nobody is in a condition to explain why the city that surrounds them, the city in a strictly architectural sense, is as it is a kind of senseless discourse. Architecture, after being literally torn to shreds, has died, and it would seem definitely so. But if we ask how this has happened, says Giorgio Grassi, we realize that it is a strange story, as grotesque as it is depressing and truly discouraging. The language of architecture, that is to say architecture as language, has died because it has been deliberated, suppressed, erased. Or, in other words, the old language of architecture has died and it's buried beneath its own ruins, destroyed, in fact, broken into little pieces and deliberated reduced to such small fragments that they no longer serve any purpose. So it is not a language that has fallen into disuse, being progressively and slowly replaced, but a new and more appropriate one that has reoccupied its place. End of quotation. In short, taking into account the dual distinctions, distinction between natural and artificial, artificial catastrophes, the one that befell contemporary architecture was, according to Giorgio Grassi, a consequence of human nature. In other words, it was an, a natural catastrophe. Architecture, Dead Language 2. Four years later, in 88, in the context of the publication of a monograph about his most recent projects, Grassi again wrote about the death of language of architecture, but now in order to reflect upon his own work. This second version of the essay does begin with a passage from Bertolt Brecht. Brecht said, constructions that are almost in ruins still have the appearance of incomplete and grandiose projects. Their beautiful measurements can already be divined. They no longer have a need for our understanding. 
and more than anything else, they have already rendered their service. They have, in short, been superseded. All this makes me happy. This, this is a eulogy to the ruins of architecture written by Brecht, which Grassi wished to make his with this epigraph. And architecture dead language too is precisely this. It is no longer a settling of accounts with the catastrophe of contemporary architecture, but rather the marking out of a space of resistance that enables him, Grassi, and architecture he believes in to resist. It is a well-known fact that after the catastrophe of Lisbon earthquake, King José, faced with the fear of living in architectural interior spaces, he is said to have suffered from claustrophobia. He decided until his death to live forever in an encampment installed in the hills of Ajuda, in the suburbs of Lisbon, in order to house the court on a temporary basis. Ironically, after the Lisbon catastrophe, Grassi's space of resistance finds in the tents of the Portuguese court a real and partly contradictory metaphor. Grassi cultivates the tranquility of ruins whereas King José tent, given its ephemeral and textile condition, was in no danger of collapsing and falling into ruins. King José fled from the ruins of Lisbon after the earthquake, whereas Grassi delights, in inverted commas, in the ruin of his own architecture, as you can see, and in his case, there is no metaphor since in the student halls of residence in Chieti, the construction went no further than the basic structural elements and was turned into a ruin, an artificial ruin, Grassi would say, without ever having entered into operation. And as the authors also says, was swiftly demolished in 2004 with remarkable efficiency by the university institution without any logical explanation. He said, at the students' halls of residence in Chieti, the determination to transform that place, the desire to do justice, to give it an identity, to show how the city and the countryside could have been there at the meeting point through an example, the fragment of a colonnade street, was so strong that in the project, the final design ended up losing its importance. To the extent that it was interchangeable with the same exemplary solutions borrowed in the course of the work, thus Weinbrenner's Langerstrasse does not represent a model, but a fair and adequate solution for the practical problem. So, they are projects that repeat things that have already been said, which makes it inevitable, states Grassi, that my work resorts only to ancient examples and to some small and lateral experiments with modern architecture. I shall not, not spend any longer in this context Delving into the reasons that explain the presence of this strategy of resistance in this author's architecture, I shall try to give you a more precise idea of this architecture of resistance through another more banal example. In other words, one that is less disciplinary in nature and at the same time perhaps more impressive than Grassi's architecture, which, as I have said, is not made to please even though his drawings, I think, are impressive. I shall limit myself to extracting, extracting the main consequence of this second version of architecture dead language. The death of the usual language of architecture, of 
its customary essence has various unsurmountable consequences, and among all of these, both visible and invisible, the one that most concerns Grassi is the discipline loss of its center, more precisely of the city as a collective space. While at the same time, the consequence that on the other hand most reassures him, a light at the end of the tunnel that can only be perceived in this second version of the text is the ruin of architecture itself, even though that ruin is artificial. Because in its deliberate, critical and didactic incompleteness, as if its amputation were a sign of a profound absence, it represents what we might describe as an architecture in praise of the unfinished. A formulation that occurs to me based on Agustina Besseluis through the hand of Silvina Rodrigues Lopes, and to which I shall return at the end of my essay. Architecture and still life. In a certain way, the quotation from Brecht and Grassi's peace of mind when confronted with the ruin of architecture has a disciplinary explanation. In several of his texts, Grassi states that faced with catastrophe of contemporary architecture, his choice is to head in the opposite direction, just as Thomas Bernard himself also did in relation to the characters in his novels. What I, what I shall therefore attempt to show is that architecture, which is heading in the opposite direction to the prevailing winds. So that we can understand this possibility, we must first of all recognize for architecture, besides the value of its use and enjoyment, a whole range of other values that are just as more important that than its being a container of uses. For this purpose, I thought that it might be useful if we consider, if you were to consider the idea of still life, originating from painting, to classify a certain state or stage in Grassi's optimistic idea, typical of architecture that has aged over time with the marks of use normally displayed by someone or something that has lived an intense life, which does not vanish when faced with its own momentary functional obsolescence. However, the pictorial gen gender of still life, natureza morta, or dead nature, in Portuguese, which forms part of the title of my presentation, is not sufficient for the hypothesis that I propose to develop. And so, in order to complement this idea, I shall also resort the notion of living nature, natureza viva, or which the notion of still life itself depends. There is a character in a short story by Almeida Faria who talks about the genre of still life in a way I found interesting and which in this case may be of help for us. The character says, I don't like to use the term natureza morta, dead nature, to describe the representations of flowers or victuals, cutlery, books, papers, domestic or musical objects. It would be more correct to call them still life or still living, but the French language obliged me to do this. A friend of mine used to say out of malice that I was more inclined towards naturezas vivas, living nature. It happens that for me, naturezas mortas are naturezas vivas. In From Tabula Rasa Revisitada to Chrono Chaos, I tried to explain how a certain architecture, even if it fails from the social point of view, and even if it hastens to impute the responsibility for this failure to architects and architecture, 
may justify its survival based on its exemplary nature of social architecture from a precise historical time. At that time, I wrote, the concrete and unrepeatable case has acquired expression and implies unique and non-generalizable choices, such as the one implied and required by Allison and Peter Smithson's Robin Hood Gardens residential state. Since one may argue in favor of maintaining this problem problematical building from the social point of view, and even the argument that with the demolition, the Robin Hood Gardens estate does not disappear like smoke, and that is a design it will forever remain in the discipline through photographs, drawings, the written word, the spoken word, etc. We should not allow ourselves to be satisfied with this. In so far as it is its exemplary nature, that is to say its quality of being an artifact in which the how can be scrutinized, that matters to us and that we wish to be able to observe and even touch with our hands, see and feel. We literally want to accompany its material life, even if ultimately the building may dissipate into still life, being transformed into a fossil that only bears witness to the, uh, to the existence of a previous life, precisely as happens at the Parthenon or the Pantheon in Rome. Five, the death of modern architecture with a fixed date and time. In fact, my radical and perhaps excessive defense of the still life in architecture arose from the need to defend from extinction a building from the time of the revision of modern movement. In other words, from the period of history of architecture that arose with the emergency urbanism required by the post-war reconstruction efforts. Despite the limitations and the constraints of this post-war architecture, in other words, despite the fact that the construction processes were undertaken under fragile conditions, beset by shortages and within a time frame that was too short to allow for any reflections and about the experiments that were made before their generalized adaptation, despite the lack of experience in solutions with those dimensions, but also despite the total lack of experience in the city itself without blocks and neighborhoods and without any clear boundaries between the interior and the exterior, public and private, individual and collective. In my view, and as proved by the Robin Hood Gardens from Allison and Peter Smithson, architectural solutions were attempts whose failure has much more complex explanations than those that were hurriedly presented at that time. On the other hand, the very idea of the tabula rasa, or clean slate, has been attributed indiscriminately and far too lightly to modern architecture and the modern city, and that immediately with greater but not complete reason to Le Corbusier Aten Charter. But also in relation to this attribution and other accusations, it would be convenient to ask in opposite, opposition to this when you look at photographs of cities and neighborhoods devastated by war, can we attribute the tabula rasa effect to the modern city that thought to rebuild them or to the war that erased the memory of them and turned them into a clean palimpsest for their modern he writing? Criticism of architecture of the modern movement is a complex question. I'm referring to the famous and deliberate demolition of Prito Uigo, an housing estate developed as a result of a public initiative 
in the city of St. Louis in Missouri in the United States in the 20th century, middle of 20th century. After months of preparation, the first building was demolished by controlled detonation at 3.32 p.m. on 15 July 72, according to Charles Jenks, the moment with a fixed date and time of the death of modern architecture. There is no doubt that the Brito Ego project observed all the dictates of the dogmatic modern city, canonized in the already mentioned famous Athens Charter, with roads traffic separated from the pedestrian footpaths, with collective open spaces between the housing blocks, distanced from one another in keeping with strict rules. It had well-intentioned solutions in relation principles, but these revealed themselves to be ill adept to the banal everyday life of the inhabitants. Mainly, the fleeting experience of these neighborhoods clearly show how the novelty and originality of the solutions did not amount to any guarantee of success. On the contrary, it highlights the nature of architecture as craft, a slow heart that cannot dispense with accumulation of experiences. In this sense, it is an activity that is closer to handicraft, or so-called popular art, than from the latest scientific experiments and techniques. An activity that is not so progressive as it may appear to be. As Alvar Cesar says, an activity in which repeating is never repeating, in which for this very reason, Bloom's anguish of influence cannot dominate and impede the critical reconstruction, reconstruction of an age-old and timeless idea, such as that of the architecture of the city from Rossi. This is, of course, one of the most powerful episodes in the history of architectural catastrophes. I would say that from the iconographical point of view, it does perhaps provide us with the most impressive images of that same history. However, another and, in every aspect, more tragic catastrophe, the fall of the Twin Towers in New York, was to join together in just one author architect, Minoru Yamazaki, the architectural authority of the spaces where both episodes would find a place. Both events, the programmed demolition of a problematical social housing state in St. Louis, and the planned and successful demolition of two iconic skyscrapers in New York by a radical Islamic terrorist group have turned this architect, Minoru Yamazaki's work, into one of the most tragic works of our time. It is important to note, and for me to describe to you, how after the criticism and in a certain sense the demonization of the Brito Ego state, we now recognize today that what failed was not exclusively or even largely either the architecture or the disappointment of its inhabitants in relation to the conditions that were offered to them there. But rather, the fragile conditions that existed for the maintenance of the buildings, the collective spaces and the public spaces, and the shortage and insufficiency of the support services and infrastructures that were offered to the community housed based there. In relation to this question, a recent documentary or cinematic journalism entitled The Brito Ego Myth and Urban History, through, through its collection of statements by people who lived and resided in the neighborhood, inform us about an alternative story. They say, the residents recall their utter joy when they moved in, not only at the plumbing, heating and electricity, but also at views and the warmth of community. When I moved in, it was one of the most, most exciting days of my life, says one 
interview. My memories of Prito Wigo are some of the best I have, says another. When calls her flat a poor man's penthouse, people remember a wonderful building with so many different smells of cooking and so many kids to play with. The film charts the degeneration, the lifts that stopped working, the rubbish incinerators that failed the winter, that the pipes burst, the rise of bullying and gangs. Eventually, there is horror. Regardless of what might be understood today as a remitification that time has helped us to reconstruct in the collective imagination of some nostalgic inhabitants of that neighborhood, the reality is that the most recent these explaining the demolition are now quite different ones. Attributing responsibility to the deliberate disinvestment and disinterest of the local public authorities in that public residential operation. Six, Kleber Mendonça Filho, one Aquarius. I thought a certain idea of architecture and consequently the defense of a certain idea of city may certainly be shown in diverse ways and by resorting to various types of representation. To show you the path in the opposite direction, which I have been referring in order to express a position of resistance on the part of my craft, I shall, as I said, substitute Grassi's architecture with another architecture seen through the eyes of a filmmaker, Kleber Mendonça Filho. I think that in this way, I shall make my description more hyper-realistic. I shall comment on two of these films that form part of a triptych, Neighboring Sounds, Aquarius, and Baucurau, the third film in this triptych, which I have excluded from this exile of mine. And in fact, I must say my comments about the film will be based on the director's spoken statements. In a recent interview, Francisco Ferreira questioned Kleber Mendonça Filho about the importance that the definition of space of the city has acquired in his films. He said, the architecture of the city of Recife was already a central element in neighboring sounds. Could you tell us about the appearance of the building in which the film takes place, the Aquarius of the title? You said that the building, furthermore, is treated as if it were a character. Does it have a certain dignity? Asked the interviewer. That's a good word, replied Clever Mendonça Filho. For me, it was important that there should be nothing wrong with the building. That is, that it should fit in every respect with Clara's character. I'm going to tell you a story so you can see what I'm trying to get at. In 1998, uh, I bought a car that remained in my hands until recently. Or in other words, it was transformed into an old car, a Fiat Palio. There were some problems with the paintwork, but apart from that, it works well. The brakes worked and the air condition was impeccable. Everything was fine. But at a certain moment, I began to feel a really, a real, really great social pressure to change my car. In Brazil, the middle class drives new cars. A car is a status symbol. It was this idea of the social pressure which is exerted on us that ended up being included in the Aquarius in a more complex way. Clara, lives in a building that society considers to be old, and that because of this has to be knocked down. For Clara, however, it is not like this. That is where she has her house, her apartment, with her memories, some of, uh, of which are difficult ones, and above all, with everything that her present life demands of her. 
it should be stressed that Clara is not a woman who leads her life from an idealized past. In fact, her car is a modern Jeep, which like all modern cars, has grown in comparison with a car from the time when the building was constructed, the 60s, being portrayed in the film as half inside and half outside the old garage in the collective yard of the condominium, since, ironically, it is the only way that it can fit into the antiquated garage while still making it possible to open the doors when getting out. However, what I should like to stress is the way in which Kleber Mendonça Filhos answer can be regarded as a testimony uh, to this awareness of the tension between the old and the new, or in other words, between the qualities of the old when compared with the new. A characteristic feature of architecture, with, as, which, as Adolf Luz explains very well, does not always, for him, Adolf Luz, almost never, I should stress, mean that the new is better than the old. Or, in the final analysis, that outgrowing and going behind the old is not in itself a motivation a priori, it is a characteristic of certain activities, such as handicraft, architecture, and construction, all of which are children of the arts and are therefore umbilically connected to art, whose original vocation involves the creation or recreation of artifacts. In my view, this vision of the world, which is clearly visible in Clever Mendonça films, implies a certain idea of architecture, which his cinema talks about and provides visual, sound basis and kinetic evidence of, so intensely so that the other senses, namely the remaining three that compose the classical pentology, smell, taste and touch, are displayed in our minds when his films are projected. In the same interview, when faced with the question about the motivated, what motivated his choice of that building, Kleber Mendonça went even further from the point of view of identifying an architecture that is of interest to him. At root, I'm talking about this idea. We are happy with our life, and someone begins to think that we are not well. It is as if this were an imposed hallucination. And so we begin to wonder, is everything all right with me? Recently, me and my wife Emily began looking for another house to live in. And we live roughly two kilometers from the place where the film is set. We realize that the places that we like most are cheaper and older. News and expensive buildings are hateful for us. There's a reversal of values that seems very interesting to me and which you, you can find in the film. When you take a stance against the established truth, either you deride for being against things or you, or you are treated as a lunatic. Anyone nowadays who questions what's going on in Brazil is immediately labeled a madman or a criminal. This narrative is so primary that it takes all the oxygen of, out of any possibility of discussion. So like this, I'll go back to your word, dignity. It was in fact important that the building had dignity. That is, was a reflection of Clara herself and her marvelous aging process, let it be said. The apartment had to be crystalline in that sense. It had to say where Clara came from and what she wants from life. Is there a direct relation with reality or in other words, the building empty or does someone live there? Asked the interviewer. No, no, replied Clever Mendonça Filho. There are families living there. In the film it's empty, but it's a living building. 
That is to say, the building is inhabited, and therefore, although it's presented in the film as a potential still life, in reality, it belongs to the world of living nature. And as a potential still life, it shows, through its architecture, the energy that enables it to resist. And this force that architecture may signify was significantly portrayed, not by an architect, but by a film director. I stress that, for me, the strength of this building, Aquarius, lies in its architecture. Even though we don't even know who is the architect was, and because we don't know this, we don't even know if there was an architect who designed it, or if the building was even just designed by a draftsman or an engineer, and therefore without an architect. For me, and this is the case, this is a fairly irrelevant piece of information. Not that I'm not interested, I immediately start researching the matter. But my judgment of the building as a living organism does not exclusively depend on this condition. In fact, so that you can understand that I'm not trying to squirt around questions that are very much in fashion nowadays and which are very important to me, but which in general have become banal and commonplace and devoid of any meaning. It is worth taking time to read you one last passage from the interview about the question of participation. Wasn't it complicated getting there with a film crew? Asked the interviewer. It is always difficult, but we were immensely lucky. The residents helped a lot, replied the filmmaker. In my view, what Clever Mendonça Filho attributes to luck can only be seen as a commitment to his cinematic project, which means that this or his cinema, just like the architecture that his cinema represents, has an audience, audience, but at the same time, because this isn't consensual, it still arouses a sense of strangeness and even a feeling of repulsion in some spectators. That is to say, participation in artistic or architectural processes, in this case, it's the same thing, I think, always implies the creation of a division between those who keep their distance because they consider that there, in that architecture or with that cinema, they have gone too far along the path in the opposite direction to return to the formulation of Grassi, Bernard, and the others. Without this effect, in other words, based on a supposed agreement as to, be, as to the objective for the artistic or architectural work, you cannot do anything other than disguise a debate which will always exist between different ways of looking at the world. I therefore conclude my presentation with a banality, drawing attention to the fact that I don't believe in an architecture that does not seek to display a certain worldview. Just as I do not believe in the supposed pacification, so eloquently promised by the supposed creative processes in which people have participated. Seven, and to finish, Kleber Mendonça Filho, two neighboring sounds. This question, relating to the supposed neutrality of the gaze was once again discussed in another interview with Clever Mendonça Filho. In reality, states the director, I wouldn't be able to do anything like what I see quite clearly on Brazilian television, which in general finds it very important to not have a point of view. It's all neutral. For me, this is impossible. For me, it's very important that people should have a point of view. The residents meeting in neighboring sounds is apparently neutral, but it has a point of view showing a little of how certain bour bourgeois behave in Brazil. First, it's me, then next, it's me, and finally, it's just me that matters. 
significantly in this interview, we once again encounter some very sensitive architectural themes. For example, when talking about the possible cinematic language, the interviewer invokes the tradition of Westerns, in particular the dramatization and cinematic representation of the surrender when someone is forcibly placed under siege, a classic theme in this genre. In order, in order to state that the director adapted this discursive resource to the reality of the private condominiums and uncontrolled urbanization of Recife. They are all surrounded, said Clever Mendonça Filho. Nobody understands this, but they are all under siege. You have to pass through three gates to get into the house, and then there's a no man land where you remain under observation. It's uncomfortable and stupid, but they don't understand. It's the exaltation of social isolation. There are more and more barriers and obstacles. We feel like rats in a laboratory. All of this is, however, very photogenic, very safe and hygienic for some people. Neighboring sounds takes place in very normal places. Kitchens, corridors, in street. Nothing is spectacular. Everything is very commonplace, concluded. It should be noted how this extraordinary definition of architecture, in which nothing is spectacular, but everything is very commonplace, requires a project design theory, theory an architectural philosophy, if I may be so bold in this context, that is everything but neutral. It was interesting, uh, said Kleber Mendonça, that to, you, said the interviewer, that you talked about the question of the house, about that almost portrait-like dimension of very house in which each person lives. Basically, the house is an image of ourselves. I say that it's interesting because your cinema is very spatial. One of the things that most impressed me has to do with a certain speciality of the sound, which is in fact suggested in the actual title of the film, Neighboring Sounds. I wonder if your film first came into being in your ear or in your gaze, asks the interview. No, I think that the most important thing is the story, states Kleber Mendonça Filho. Secondly, there's the idea that the sounds came out of the window and also entered through the same windows. Sometimes you are alone, but you can hear your neighbor. It may be six o'clock in the morning. The sound is part of the surrounding environment, even if we are not the ones making it. And that dichotomy is very present in the film. Bia, the character, feels attacked by the sound of a dog but she's the only one who turns into the frequency of its bark. Her husband and her children don't. That ability to turn in isn't just a question of sound. It's, a, it's psychological too. To end and to conclude, in the architecture that I'm concerned with, the classical five senses, besides other more modern ones, are part and parcel of an inalienable project. Thus, for example, even in those architectures that touch me most, there is always something else that can be added. They are architectures that can never be considered completed. Since they are Albertian, they are also in that sense a eulogy of the unfinished, as I have already said. In the problematic and colloquial words of Clever Mendonça Filho, in Europe, people tend to say, it's done like this, it's done like this. In Brazil, we tend to say more, it's done like this, but it can also be done another way. Electrodomestica, a short film by this same director, has a lot to do with this idea. She, the character uh, in, this, in his film, is an unstable human. To try and improve her existence, 
she subverts things. The washing machine isn't just a washing machine. The vacuum cleaner isn't just a vacuum cleaner. I like that subversion, that small anarchy. Perhaps this small story metaphorically explains the architecture of resistance that I wanted to talk to you about in re relation to the catastrophe of my craft. In my view, it is only the construction of a worldview, always an alternative one, since the architect is the person who designs and transforms what does not yet exist and who thinks about what it may become. Links to the idea of an open but precise architecture, which will enable us to head in the opposite direction, like Grassi Bernard said. Okay, and that's what I wanted to explain you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, to uh, Professor Jose uh, Miguel uh, Rodriguez for uh, this uh, uh, best and uh, um, very powerful communication. And uh, we have uh, uh, a bit of time for uh, uh, just for some, uh, for some answers. Uh, before to take a little break for uh, a coffee and uh, uh, then to uh, give the word uh, um, to Professor Andrew Benjamin. So if uh, uh, there are if, uh, some, uh, some questions here at the museum and of course uh, for someone uh, who is uh, uh, connected to our meeting can uh, eventually um, make a question uh, through the chat. Thank you. 
to come place against, uh, uh, not against, but mixed with uncontrolled urbanism. Urbanism. Uh, with uncontrolled urbanism is at the same time an effect of its self-destruction of the discipline, but also the developing, the natural developing of the capitalism system. Um, it's, uh, um, perhaps these, these points could be uh, now in your, in your answer. replaced uh, in, your, in your experience as an architect and as a, and above all as someone who studies or is implied uh, self in studying this terrible evolution and also this kind of forgetting um, from the part of so architect, architects um, about the self-destruction. Is not not be aware, not be aware, aware of this, and work as it, it would be the same always. With the, I like very much to hear that uh, there are motifs that repeat themselves, but it's not the common of the repeating of the motifs. Someone who cannot hear and cannot see what's going about himself and continues to answer like everything was all right. This conversation about this, this person about I, me, and myself, <laughs> as uh, Louis Bourgeois says, uh, is very, very happy in our intention. Um, and the historical point of view, I think, at the same time. Uh, may I say something about your comments, uh, Maria Filmena? Uh, I think you, you might be interested in Clever Mendonça Filho um, cinema, I think. I'm not sure, of course. Because, uh, in a way, I found in that films uh, and in Brazil, what I think it can occur to us in the very next future. I think in Brazil, the, the, there is a kind of hyperbolization of the reality. And I think most of my colleagues, architects, uh, have gone to the direction of the uh, dominant uh, uh, wings. And the, oh, they, 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 they go in the direction that Grassi and Bernard don't want to go. And so, I, in a way, I decided to, to not do so much architecture and trying to teach to students this other direction. Because it's so difficult at uh, the present times to resist that I think some of us uh, must have to come back to a kind of, uh, of a castle <laughs> to explain the others what is the problem. And, and there, are, there are lots of problems and of course I have to cut uh, some of the problems, but even in uh, the university and the way the researching in my area is promoted, um, tends to see the originality as something that uh, is going to dominate uh, the world. And if I look to your work, or to uh, Alberti's work, or to Caesar's work in uh, our present time, I, I saw the contrary of that idea of science as a kind of uh, permanent uh, progress. And, and it is interesting that in our uh, uh, 
elementary decisions, for instance, to rent an apartment or to buy an apartment. That's why I, I really enjoyed the interview of Clever Mendonça I read after I saw the films repeatedly three times. Um, he, he spoke us about his own experience of looking at the building and prefer uh, a building that already exists, even if it is old, as the character of the film, than the, 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 the new one. And when I thought the discourse, for instance, about sustainability, which is very in fashion in my profession, I'm using the word that Grassi and Aldo Rossi hated. It's very interesting because it's not, uh, it don't have the same meaning. In Portuguese, profissão is, is beautiful, but in their Italian language, it's different. But uh, I, I found uh, at that position of uh, a filmmaker uh, my point of view as uh, an architect. And sometimes, for me, it's very uh, difficult to explain with uh, more with grassy constructed architectures because he constructed uh, very, not very much, on the contrary. And, 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 and Aldo Rossi, which is, I think it's also a very resistant architecture, and that has the, the, the merit that he works with the strange matter of the, even of the, 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 um, the capitalistic city. Um, he, he has, of course, uh, um, a larger visibility, but both of them, they are working about the, the, the same position. And some, sometimes I find that Giorgio Grassi writings, that's why I decided to translate to Portuguese everything he wrote, and I know the texts are read in Brazil, which for me is something very interesting, um, is, is because I, I, I really believe that if we understand what is happening in my craft, to use the word they prefer, both, maybe, I think it's too much to believe, but maybe I can save my craft from the extinction. And in the end, I'm an op optimistic uh, architect. So I find it possible, and I find it possible when, for instance, I read some philosophers, um, like you, Maria Filomena, because I found in, um, what you write, the same interest in re-reading and rethinking what has happened in the past, but in a very contemporary way. I, I didn't find the same position, uh, for instance, in my colleagues of history, only in a, in a very uh, small group. For instance, José Matos, I, f I found the same position, but in my university, I have difficulty to, to, to speak with them. And that's why, I, uh, uh, in the end, I thought I, I must try to substitute Giorgio Grassi architecture by something more understandable. And I think Clever Mendonça Filho statements in the three films is more understandable. Because I think that you that are uh, from the exterior of my discipline might uh, help me to save the craft for, from the extinction. For me, it, it was a surprise that you invite me to, to speak here today and to participate in your um, research project. I, I must say, I decided to make a, a proposal that went about Cesar Barroco, that I don't know how I, we win the, the the research uh, project uh, in the FCT um, area, because I have so much difficult to make me understand uh, at the area of science that is dominating architecture. Thank you. So there are uh, two 
two or three <laughs> with the mind uh, questions. Uh, um, uh, well, if we. Then may I make the suggestion? Perhaps you make the questions? Or will you amend the presenting of these answers? I can imagine that they are possibly related. To yes, okay. maybe it is, a, it is a possibility, so uh, we can take a uh, uh, um, break just now. No, 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 no
um, interpret, for instance, uh, the uh, impact, you know, uh, the cultural impact of uh, uh, the following bu uh, buildings and of the photos of uh, following buildings in the history of uh, uh, present current architecture. Okay, let me start by the ruins and then the reconfiguration and then the following uh, buildings again. <laughs> uh, I, of course, I, I totally agree with you. And, and Giorgio Grassi, with author with, with both you and me. Because in a way, I think that sometimes in present times, we are, uh, we know, but people that are uh, commanding the coordination of cities, they, they, they really want to make the tabla rasa again. And the ruins are, besides they are beautiful most of the times because the nature quickly uh, occupies, reoccupies uh, its, her place in the composition, but they can be appropriated in very different ways, and in the end, they, they can be rebuilt. And we know uh, today that the material of a structure is something that it's, it's very important. The Romans thought like this, and uh, we, the contemporary architects, thought that the, the concrete or the walls were not so very important. We could demolish everything at very low cost. But we know today that those infrastructures, they, they represent a kind of, of beginning of a new architecture. So uh, uh, when Giorgio Grassi, in the second version of the text, um, speaks about ruins. He, he, makes a, he makes himself photograph in the, in the ruin of, of Chieti uh, Students Hall. And the, the professor, which is a Catalan professor, uh, with, uh, I have uh, started my uh, post PhD research, which is Professor Lauerta, wrote a beautiful text that uh, said something like this. Uh, Giorgio Grassi is really uh, amazed with the ruin of his architecture. But of course, he, he, he was thinking about a new destiny to that building because he thought that in, his basic, in its basic principles, it might be another thing. It might be... Uh, uh, a domestic building, a building to live in, or, or something else. Giorgio Grassi, uh, um, one year ago, he called me to say that the most beautiful building he built, I think he agreed with me, which is a library uh, in, uh, uh, in Netherlands, was going to be adapted to another, used, another use, and they called him to say that they were going to put uh, another floor on the building. And he answered, everyone thinks, everyone knows, but people that don't know very well Giorgio Grassi think that he's very rigid. And he answered, okay, I think it's a good idea. And he started with a new drawing, with a new floor, and the, the library was uh, his thing to be transformed in, a, in, in, in another building. So. I think the, the, the process of aging of architecture is uh, many times to be a ruin for some decades. And the idea of cleaning the, the context is not a good idea. And of course it's not a good idea when we saw as in Porto that the ruin of a social housing state is uh, to, uh, to sell the, the, the place to the private initiative to make those buildings uh, the penthouse of the rich man and not the penthouse of the poor man that uh, the, the, the documentary speaks about the, the Prito Uigo uh, episode. Uh, concerning uh, the, the, the importance 
of the, the circular notion of fragmentation and reconfiguration, I must admit that when I first uh, read your project, I was very impressed. And I have lots of ideas after I read those very simple uh, uh, words. Um, there is a kind of history about the importance of these two words, maybe with uh, other um, formulations. For instance, Adolf Luz, with which I think it's a very important architect in the 20th century. For, I don't know if, if you know him, but he was a Hermann Brock breather, which I think it's a, a, an important detail. Uh, he always speak about, speaks about architecture as something that has two actions, destroy and build. And he's always uh, underlying the possibility of rebuilding, which in nowadays is something that the sustainable paladins are always um, showing us. So uh, I, I, I am pleased that I, I might have um, uh, speaks about something that is in, might interest you in the uh, project you are um, developing. And I think ending by this time, but maybe you can restart again and restart again if FCT agrees, which is something that I'm not sure in architecture. Uh, concerning your question, which is a very interesting question, I, I, I was underlining uh, a detail that has been in the journals, but I think that most of us uh, hasn't given sufficient uh, importance, which is the coincidence that the same architect, which is a Japanese uh, man that studied in the United States, that is this uh, Yamazaki, had built the two most catastrophic uh, buildings in the history of architecture in the 20th century. And, and I, I, I can't explain why, but I think that in the end, the, the, the explanation of the, of the, the reasons why it occurred, they sometimes are not very um, just adequate to what really happened. And I, I think the, 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 the impact of, the, the, of the, the, the falling buildings in the second episode should have changed much more how architects deal with the contemporary world. Not even in a political way, but in a, an economical uh, way. And of course, I think I'm not so radical as Giorgio Grassi, who wrote and said in an interview that he doesn't, he never have been in New York for ideological reasons. He's very radical. He, he, he never went to the United States. And he loves Ms. van der Rohe buildings and, and Sullivan buildings, which are built in the United States. But for political reasons, he decided to himself, I'm not going there. But, but, but I think even in the United States, they don't have thinking sufficient about what happened there. And I thought, uh, when I was preparing uh, this presentation, that you m might understand the catastrophe of architecture related to the catastrophe of cities, uh, um, remembering these two episodes. One that is decided by a political council, council demolishing a neighborhood that supposedly by social reasons, we know for sure today that it was not true. It was something related with the de demolishing of uh, the towers in uh, Porto. And the other, which has profound reasons, which we might uh, have things better and, and more and more and more. I don't know if I answer your questions, which are all very interesting, but very difficult. And in English, it's for me even more difficult to think. 